Is the mic positioning okay? All good? Awesome. So yeah, like I was saying earlier, um, this is gonna be a workshop, so I'm hoping people wanna play around and code with us. And it's a workshop about dynamic system modeling in CAD-CAD, which is, if you've read my abstract, I said it sounds like something a Pokemon would say, CAD-CAD. I don't know, I found that funny. And I'm gonna use Pokemons in the workshop for that, because of that. Cool. So, yeah, before we get started, a little bit about myself. I'm Bogdan, uh, I'm the CTO of Mento, which is a stable assets protocol on the Celo blockchain. So we have Celo Dollar, Celo Euro, and Celo Real, and have a stability mechanism. Uh, I used to work for Consensus, I'm a full stack engineer. I really would like to know more math, and I'm afraid of Web2. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, Cool, so yeah, what does CAD-CAD stand for? It's this nice sentence of complex adaptive dynamics, computer-aided design. Cool, so complex adaptive dynamics, what's this? Um, this is basically systems that have a form of feedback to them, that's how I'd like to think about them. It's system in which things happen, and the things that happen, the agents interact, change the state of the system, and that keeps on feeding back into itself, and yeah, growing. And computer-aided design is like, you know, everything we call things, software that we use to design things, and this is how I would like my job to look like. I think it, that would be like a nice everyday vibe, but it's not really. That makes me sad. Um, cool. So yeah, actually if somebody has a better definition of this, I'm curious, but I've been uh, hearing like complex and dynamic systems interchangeably in some situations, and I was trying to figure out like what they actually mean, and this is like the best thing I could come up with. Like, I, I, I feel like complex systems usually refers to something that's more broad and real, so like, um, I don't know, the migration path of birds is an actual complex system that we look at. And a dynamical system is actually a model of that, of a complex system, is a description in, um, yeah, just like with functions that describe the time dependency of a point in an ambient space, so I can read that. But it's more like an analytical description of a complex system. And then what we're actually interested in modeling are non-linear linear dynamical systems, which are like a subset of those, and yeah, differential equations that have non-linear terms, and that's a nice little GIF showing a pendulum which with like, you know, seemingly random motion that comes from the equations that describe it. Cool. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, and I wanted to like just let you guys know that I'm not an economist by training. I'm an engineer, so like, I'm kind of a noob at this, but I've been using CAD-CAD for like half a year now with economists to model our stability mechanism and things like that, so I've been sort of learning these things, but yeah, I'm not gonna go in very deep things about complex systems, just more about the engineering part of CAD-CAD. Cool, and like the first thing we're actually gonna talk about is the predator prey model, which is like the most, one of the most basic dynamic systems. Does, it, does anybody here know the predator prey? Nope, okay. Cool, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna use Pokemon for this because it's a bit more fun. But the idea behind the predator prey model is that you have two populations that have a dependency on each other. Uh, predators eat the prey. And when you try to model the population growth, um, you notice that you know as there is enough prey, more predators will come and the growth of eating the prey will increase as well. So the prey population will decrease. And as that happens, predators will die out more because there's not enough food. And as predators die, at some point, the prey can again increase their population because they're not as hunted. So we have these two populations that are interdependent and they will sort of find a form of equilibrium in time. And the way I'm gonna talk about it is like trainers that are trying to capture Pokemon in a, play, in a place, and Pokemons grow if there's not enough trainers to capture them, and as Pokemon grow, trainers migrate to that place, and then you know they capture more Pokemon, and we're gonna see how that plays out. And this is something you're actually gonna code. But first, we're gonna look at how it works. Mm. Cool. So, like I was saying, what we're trying to model is the Pokemon population and how it changes over time. And this is like a nice equation that shows that the delta of the population over time for Pokemon is a function of 
the growth, the natural growth of the Pokemon, which is given by this alpha term, uh, a decrease, which is like the natural death rate of the Pokemon by the beta term, and then for the gamma term is a decrease that comes from um, a function of the Pokemon and the trainers. So that's like the interaction between those two populations. And yeah, does anybody have any questions here? Does this sort of make sense for now? For the late joiners, this is like the delta of a Pokemon population in the Lotka Volterra Predator Prey model. <laughs> that's a fun sentence. Uh, <laughs> Cool, so yeah, so in time the Pokemon will naturally grow, will also decay from death, and will decay as a function of how much they're captured by trainers. And these are the three like variables that change how our system works. And for the trainers, it's a bit more simple. Trainers will migrate to this area as a function of how many Pokemon there are, and will also abandon the area in the absence of Pokemon, basically. And we get these two terms here for them. We're gonna have these equations to look at after, so there's no need to, yeah. And, okay, we have these uh, we have these equations, and now the question is, how does this map to kind of what CAD-CAD is? And CAD-CAD is super basic at heart. Um, it's just a system which has some initial parameters, so some state that it models, and some functions that change that state over time in incremental time steps. And yeah, kind of like what we're looking at here. The state variables are like the state of the of the system that we want to model. In this example, the Pokemon population, the del the yeah, what we were calculating the deltas for before. We have those two variables. Then the system parameters are, are all the alpha, but all the Greek letters earlier that kind of dictate how the system will evolve depending on how what values we set for them. And the policy functions are those things kind of the individual logic that we had had here. So like this term, you can be thought of a policy, which is the trainer migration policy. And that term there is the abandon rate, which is like a different policy of the system, and they add up. And the same for the Pokemon. This has like three policies that dictate the change in that state variable. Cool, cool, cool. Right, and the state update functions uh, it's usually just like we have those three policies, so we computed those deltas, and we change the state with that delta inside of a function. And yeah, CatCat had something that's called partial state update blocks, which just are the granularity of state updates. So we can like sequence what happens in order, and then CatCat just iterates over those state update blocks. Um, but like enough talking. Let's actually pull out our laptops and go to that link over there and start having fun in Photoshop. Oh, I want to say Photoshop. I don't know why. And Oh, yeah, good point. I, I forgot I was sharing. Yeah, so there's a readme in that repo that's really basic. Um, like, has any, has everybody went to the link? Can I change? Or uh, cool. Yeah, so this is going to be like the awkward period when everybody's installing dependencies and like things are going to break. So. Like, let's give it a couple of minutes and you can call me if things are not working.
A funny anecdote while everyone's down there, but you could change the parameters for the for the dynamics of the game, and you could just see, you know, how quickly you can make the rabbits, you know, reproduce too much, or, or the foxes kill them. Um, so you yeah, know, it's just a fun game. Yeah. So we were talking about a game on what was the platform? Oh yeah, the ZX Spectrum. Yeah, that was basically implementing the predator prey model, and yeah as a game. That was fun. That's a good point. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so we're going we to do this who's on Max or. So yes, I have forgotten about installing the uh, large file system. What is it? Large file storage for Git. But like, if that doesn't work, I, I can just send the large file to people around maybe. Because um, for the second uh, part of the workshop, we're going to look at the Uniswap pool and we're going to simulate the events coming. So there's like 100 megabytes of Uniswap events that we're going to simulate. So that's stored using LFS. But like, it should be easy to install that and then pull the LFS. Time is it? Okay. Hmm. Cool. Anybody has any more problems that I can help with? We're just waiting for. Has anybody managed to open Jupyter Notebooks yet? Here? No? OK. Is anybody looking at Meebs instead of installing software? <laughs> Sorry, which? Um, I think 3.8 should be okay, or like 3. Point Wait, let me, let me actually check what's in here. Uh, no, there's one. Seems like a fun error to have at this point. <laughs> oh, look, it's 3.8 here, and this requirement
so if people use VS Code, there's a Jupyter Notebooks VS Code plugin that helps. I mean, sometimes it acts up, but you can actually open Jupyter uh, Notebooks in VS Code and edit them here. But like, you can also do it just like by running that command, and they will open in the browser, like so. If people, yeah, either either option is okay. In case people have problems with PDM, this doesn't have like a lot of dependencies. So these can also be installed via pip in your local VM and like you can go old school if you want to. So, has anybody passed step three by now? Has anybody passed step two? <laughs> uh, and it's the problem, uh, are you having errors at step three or is it, uh, yeah? Okay, so I just pushed uh, to main a requirements.txt file. So you can do a pip install minus r that, and we can like, yeah. Or like if you're comfortable with virtual environments, you can create a virtual env, but yeah, the, let, let me open the readme as well. So I, I added like a secondary option there. Let's see if this works easier.
So we have the first person that opened the Jupyter interface. Rejoice. Uh, it's Python. Are we having more success with pip? Is it working for you? N not for you? No, I was like trying to get a sense, like not working for him, not working for you. Wait, I'm gonna come and see what's up. What 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 about on this side? What's the success ratio? Okay, thumbs up there. Okay, so it feels like we have like a 50-50 success ratio on the install, which is nice. And we can go on with like, I mean, yeah, the people will follow along. Um, okay, so I want to walk you through the predator prey part. So it's like this one underscore predator prey folder. So um, you should open this in a text editor, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and 
this is the basic cat uh, cat experiment definition we have what's called the model with which which defines the simulation and it has an initial state which is what we were talking about the two populations pokemon and trainers and we can set them up with different values um, and we have parameters that we use inside of the simulation um, which are all those things that we talked about before as Greek letters because you know the equation looked more fancy in math but here they're actually written down more humanely Pokemon reproduction rate, capture rate, death rate, trainer abandon rate and trainer growth rate. Um, you'll notice that these are passed as um, lists this is because um, RAD, uh, CADCAD allows you to specify multiple parameters and it will automatically run simulations for all those parameter combinations. So if I want to try out what it would look like with like 0 0.3 and then uh, like 0 0.2 over here, then it will like running the simulation would mean it creates all of the parameter sweeps, that's what they're called. Uh, sets of just one value and then run all those simulations in parallel and then at the end I get all of the results and can analyze them. Yeah, that's why these are defined as lists here, but when we're actually running uh, the policy functions, we're going to get just the current value for the simulation. Um, yeah, and dt is like the delta time, it's like the time step that we can define uh, however we want, like the cat cat just increments a new time step conceptually, but the delta t gives us what we think as the time increment. And the state update blocks gives us the policies that we we're talking about, like the ones that make use of the variables and create changes to the the Pokemon and the trainer population deltas. These are these are the things that we're actually gonna work at implementing now. Uh, and we have these two variables which ch which both change as a result of these policies having run. And this is basically what it takes to define a model. These state update blocks grow really complex as you have more behaviors and more state that you need to update. But in general, yeah, the, the format is pretty self-evident and simple. Um, and then we define a simulation, which we pass the model in and gives give it a number of time steps. These are the increments that will that that these are the number of like steps that will be simulated, which means that these policy functions and state update function will run three thousand times in order. And runs um, is what we use to tell it if we want to do multiple runs for each parameter set. This is if we have randomness. If we do Monte Carlo simulations and we have a source of randomness inside of the simulation, we can tell it, okay, do like 20 runs and each run will be slightly different and we can compare and see kind of the path of that simulation. But in our case, it's purely deterministic. We don't have any stochastic process, so we just do a single run. Uh, and this is just like some other boilerplate code. We create an experiment that has a simulation. An experiment can actually have multiple simulations if we want to, you know, build something really crazy. Um, setting a backend, and yeah, we don't need to care about this part. Um, but now these functions are implemented in this parts.py file. This is where we're gonna work. And this is where I've kind of rewritten the equations that were in the slides and what everything means over here. And did a bit of a transformation because like, you know, we had our e equation which was the delta Pokemon over DT, but then we can do delta Pokemon equals this times DT. Yeah, math, haha. <laughs> and DT is part of our params. All of these map to the Greek letters. They're also part of our params. And for each step, we want to calculate the delta in the end. And the delta is an aggregation of all the different behaviors. So Pokemon natural growth um, is basically this. And we return an object saying that, okay, the delta has this. Pokemon capture is another behavior that should add up to this. And what CatCat does is it aggregates all of these. So if I have multiple policies that return the same 
variable name here, like Pokemon Delta, Pokemon Delta, Pokemon Delta. At the end, all of those are added up. So what we get is kind of this equation, basically. But we write it as different behaviors. Of course, we could have also done a single one. But this kind of shows the fact that you can have independent behaviors of the system that get aggregated by cat cat. So it's kind of, this is the nicer way to write it, let's say. And we have the same for all of the trainer rates. And at the end, uh, we just um, take the from the policy input, which is what all of these policies return. We take the final delta, and we add it to the previous state, and return that as the as the updated Pokemon population. So this is kind of done. So the only thing that we need to to do to make this work is actually implement these equations here. But before we do that, we can just like run this. Wait, let me go to here. Actually, run everything. Let's go. See what happens. Yeah. So because all of those policies return zero, uh, our population kind of does nothing over time, which is you know not that fun. Um, and the first thing you can actually do on your own is try to change those parts, but in a linear fashion. So. Um, I'm going to just say that the the Pokemon population grows by one every time step, and the trainer population grows by one as well. Wow, lines! <laughs> like I, I like getting feedback, right? It's it's fun. So this kind of works, but you know, there's no interdependency between these. They just like grow linearly. So we see that in the graph nicely. Oh yeah, and I didn't really pass through this, but this is this doesn't do much. Essentially, just like some dependencies, uh, and it runs the experiment, which for which we get back this data frame. Which, if you're familiar, a pandas data frame is just like a tabular collection of data that you can do fun things with, uh, and this is the head of that. So it it shows us those two variables as they grow and gives us some pointers. So we have a, uh, only one simulation, but if we had many, that this would be the simulation index. Uh, the subset refers to what I was talking about with the parameter sweeps. If we have multiple parameter combinations that are run, these would have been the subsets. And the runs are those Monte Carlo runs if we had multiple. I don't know why they chose to index those by zero and that by one, but that's how it is, and we're going to live with it. Um, and the time step is. Um, yeah, the, the iterations of the state changes. So we see like it starts with the initial state, and then one gets added to these, and they just grow, 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 grow over time. And yeah, here we're just doing a plot of this data frame, which uh, with some yeah, we're naming the the lines and doing all of that. Cool. So now I'm gonna like. Wait for a sec for people to actually try to implement this, and I'm gonna do it as well. Um, how you s sorry? So that that's the thing. Like the the simulation runs inside of this notebook, basically. So, it, it, ooh, let's see. I'm gonna come over. Yeah, I mean, if you manage to install Jupyter and you open Jupyter Notebooks, you get this in your browser. Ah, okay. So it It works for him. Nice. So, so Jupyter Notebooks works there. Uh, Looks like yeah, it. Kind of yeah. Woo. Okay. So you can see the lines now there in your notebook. Um, yeah, they look different on my machine, but that's that's fine. So does anybody need any help with this?
or people are good. You know? Ah, that's a good point. I've actually, so yeah, that's something I actually didn't, hmm, I could have used the mic stand now. So yeah, let's do this one together. So basically, uh, uh, if if we want to get the params, we have this object passed as a function here, and we can look up what we want. So we look, we need alpha here, which is the Pokemon reproduction rate. And let's look at the experiment. Oh. Nice. Cool. So this is how we get the Pokemon and reproduction rate. And this is how we get the DT. These are all params. And the Pokemon population is part of the state. So essentially, this is kind of what we wanted for this first element, which was this. And yeah, let, let's see how it looks like if we simulate it just with this. Cool, so yeah the Pokemon kind of grow exponentially. Because <laughs> there's nobody to eat them yet. And there's no death either. They live in a fairy tale land. So let's see what happens if we add the capture. Hmm. Oh no, this should be minus. nice they're very much nerfed So how are we doing our people writing the equations? Uh, they got where how to get the state and the params. Everything's working? Yes, yes. Are we getting close to the actual oscillating systems?
Yeah, so the you know the Greek letters are in the params, the population is in the brief state because that's the one that changes. Woohoo! So if everything works, this is what you should see at some point, which is a nice oscillating system. Ah, it's so beautiful. So yes, if you're reducing, you have to put a minus. <laughs> oh yeah, that could have been the case. Sorry? Um, let's see. So if you scroll up here, you should see all of these. Yeah. I had so much fun copying like Greek letters into the comments here. <laughs> yeah, this is inside of the experiment. This is the initial state, and you can play around with these. You can also play around with the the variables here to see how like it kind of changes. And also the number of time steps. So if you want to simulate more time, you can change that. It's every, everything is in the experiment.pi. So who managed to get the wobbly lines? Um, yeah, that's it's best to do a restart because um, if you're changing like the logic, then that needs to be reimported by the kernel and all of that, and that's cached initially. So if you just rerun, it won't reimport the function changes that you made. So you have to do a restart. Uh, when when you're changing things that are just in the notebook, so if I change some code here, I don't have to restart. But the, but because those are in other files, blah blah, it needs a restart. So is anybody else close or still working on it? Yes. <laughs> it's working? Or you got it working? Let me take a look.
Ah. Uh, oh, for the DTME question, it was fine. Okay. Yeah. In the um, Yeah, no, this one. Yeah, yeah. Just missing the DT. Oops. Cool. So we're not going to have time to go through the second thing, but I want to like quickly run you through what it should have been <laughs> for fun. Um, but yeah, I hope you get to the swiggly lines. If not, uh, well, what I had planned was a different sort of use of CatCat in which you can model and compare, um, <clears throat> like model um, a system and then compare it with the actual state, which was interesting. So uh, I modified an example from like the CatCat repo and this includes a bunch of events emitted by the Uniswap v1 die ETH pool um, that we can use to model the behavior of the contract and then compare that model to the reality, essentially. Um, and we have a list of these events and these map to changes in that state. We have three state items that we care about, how much DAI is in the pool, how much ETH is in the pool, and how much uh, LP token was minted by the pool. And we can process these events and make changes to that state. And the parameters of the systems are this list of events and what fee do we want the pool to take. In the Uniswap we want the fee is hard-coded actually in the contract. So it's like, meh. But you can experiment and play around with it. And I'm gonna like, go quickly through some math, which is like given um, given an amount of ETH you want to sell to the contract and the balances of the contract and a fee of 0.3%, uh, how much die do you get back from that contract? And if you actually you know, play around with the equations, you end up with <coughs> those as like some generalized formulas. Um, Given that you rewrite the fee as the inverse and have it have a nominator and then a denominator. So like instead of thinking as the fee as 0.3%, we think of like 1 minus 0.3%, that's 997 over 1,000. And we can have those nice formulas there for um, the amount of die. And this is what we need to use when we're doing like a token purchase or a need purchase. Because what we want to simulate is uh, how much yeah, how, how much does the pool balances change when token or ETH are getting purchased. Of course, adding liquidity and moving liquidity is kind of simple. That just adds to the pool, you know. Um, so you can play with this on your own time. It's a kind of fun one. Let's, I, I think I, I went on a branch that has everything built in. Choo -choo -choo. This also has more fun um, visualizations than the first experiment. So I encourage you all to play around with it. Pam, pam, pam. Oh, yeah. This experiment takes a while because it's simulating all, I don't know, I think a couple hundred thousand events over this model. But yeah, while, while it's running, I can quickly just go through the code so it kind of makes sense. Um, wait, experiment, cool. So we have only one policy, which is decoding the event or the action. And then we have these three variables, well, we have these four variables. I actually didn't use price ratio in the end, but I forgot to remove it from here, uh, which is the die balance, the eat balance, and the LP token supply. Um, this is the hmm, kind of like the date, the, the how an event is in this data source I found, which is like this pickle, which is why I had the LFS thing happening. Um, and oh yeah, I want also wanted to show like a cool thing you can do if you try to type your actual your params. So here. And the system params, I, I did it a bit nicer than it was in the first experiment. So I actually created type dicts for the params and had the initial ones like this. Um, that means that you can, and also for the state variables, created like a nice type dict, which means that then you can have that in your policy functions and actually type them and you know get out the complete inside of the dicts, which is nice. Um, 
But for this Uniswap, it's basically decoding the, ac the event into an action and then outputting the deltas. And my actions are the ones that we talked about. So it can be either selling ETH or selling tokens, depositing, withdrawing, uh, LP token minting or LP token burning which is uh, happens for a transfer event because like the the old uh, v1 pools implemented like ERC20 interface for the LP tokens um, yeah and th this includes some logic like the interesting one is here like the one that I was showing as math where we actually calculate how much eth to um, how much eth you get for die and so on and let's see if we, this has finished running. Chim, 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 chim. Cool. So actually, the fun part is, so what's, what's being mapped here um, it's the, is the ETH supply, I think. Wait. Oh, yeah, no. The, the first one is the ETH balance. The second one is the DAI balance. And the third one is the uh, LP token supply. And Actually, the real history and the yellow are overlapped. You can actually see them. So like the values that we get from parsing the events and the values that we get from uh, simulating it with 0 0.3 fee are the same. But you can see like how the system would have behaved if, if we had different fees inside of the pool. So that's sort of fun to see, like how with the same events, but like a different fee structure. And the other thing that you can actually see by doing this which I wanted to show, and it's fun, um, is the return, the ROI of like being a 50-50 hodler, just holding ETH, or being a liquidity provider at the different fees. And you can sort of graph that pretty easily uh, now that you have this data, which is kind of nice. And yeah, of course, like you get most money if you would be a liquid provider with like 1% fee. That's sort of obvious, but even like the ETH holder sometimes, you know, does better, does worse. But it's cool, you know. We have like we now have a model where we can um, easily simulate an LP pool. So there's actually a branch called Solved where you can run this. Let's see. Uh -huh. What else do I want to tell you about? Cool. Yeah. And the last thing that I can show really fast is that we have an actual. We use this at Mento to simulate our stability protocol. Cool, so in the same organization where the CatCat workshop are, there's the simulation which is a really complex repo where we simulate our stability mechanism. And I can show you really, really fast something here, which is kind of cool. Choo -choo -choo. I'm not going to run it now, but it's already run. This is a stable token simulation with arbitrage. And like the fun part is here, which is like, this is the actual stable token price that's simulated in this experiment. And you can see like how it moves around one because it's back to the dollar. But like in different arbitrage cycles, the price gets back and close depending on market movements. So yeah, this is a pretty cool setup that we use with CatCat to be able to experiment with different components for our stable token mechanism. Yay, and we're at time. Anybody has questions? <laughs> Um, yeah, with the simulation you did by reading events and replaying it with different fees, um, is that the part of CatCAD that's just the dynamic modeling part, or is that also got the agent part? Uh, like with CatCAD, there's the, the dynamic model where you, and you have that structure there. But there was the other part of CatCAD I understand is the agent models, where you can say this is a type of behavior, or a, are you using both sides of that? Or so, so CatCAD doesn't give you really primitives for agents. No. Yeah, no, it doesn't. You have to kind of build that yourself. Uh, the only primitive that you have is this idea of a state change. If that state change comes from an agent that you're simulating that does a certain action, that's kind of okay, but uh, it doesn't come with primitives yeah, for I that. I was curious, was that with agents or? or um, that was, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't really with agents because okay. we're just like decoding an event. Gotcha. This simulation has agents actually in it. We have like different traders that behave with different parameters and awesome. they're like simulating as, yeah, 
more like okay. s individual entities and yeah it's closer to an agent based Great. simulation thank you yeah anybody else cool then thank you very much for your time